I am Sean D. Tucker and this is what I do. I've put my whole adult life into learning how to fly rock and roll aerobatics. It's, I consider it an art form and I am one of the best in the world. I got back stick to keep me forward and forward stick to keep me back. That's enough. Oh yeah. I love my job, folks. And the reason being is because I'm totally focused and dedicated to learning how to fly the, that airplane through the sky, upside down, right side up, tail first, tumbling, end over end, 10, 15, 15 times, flying backwards for 500 feet. Oh, that hurt. That was good. That was good. And what I want to do is be the best aviator that I can be, to be the best aerial entertainer I can be. And what's very, very cool about my job is I'm still learning how to fly that airplane. It is a quest, a challenge. All right, folks, thanks for coming to practice. You kids, live your dreams, man. Do whatever you want. It's OK.
How many people can look into a mirror and say, I changed the world? Wilbur and Orville Wright did that in 1903 with man's first controlled powered flight. 59 seconds that changed the world. They were first, but as always, other curious, inventive minds were already standing on the right shoulders to create the next steps in flight. They were Europeans, many of them, and within a decade of the Kitty Hawk event, French, German, and other designer engineers on the continent were leading the way in new aviation technology and research. Well, officials in Washington were paying attention, and they realized they could not let the Europeans vault past American efforts in aviation. So they formed a new organization, NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. It oversaw coordinated efforts to make sure the U.S. led the way in aviation technology. And for more than 40 years, NACA did just that, guiding research from World War I right up to the supersonic age. Your position is good, Joe. Pump idle. Good pump. Good igniter. Ready to launch now. Because the airplane exceeded the design limits, both speed and, and in altitude, the airplane was flown to an altitude where it was felt it was not effective to go any higher with the X-15. Um, the risk increased much more than what the benefits gained were going to be, and, and the lesson was learned. As far as speed was concerned, uh, there was an attempt to go much faster with the X-15 than its design limit of Mach 6, and that was to add additional propellant um, in the form of external tanks that would be dropped off. And the purpose was to get the airplane out to a speed of about Mach 8. It turned out that really with some things, very, <laughs> very painful lessons learned that the overlaying shock waves just increased the heating even that much more at those hypersonic speeds. And, and uh, at about 6.7, uh, the shock wave from this little dummy ramjet, scramjet engine, impinged on the lower ventral and literally burned it off. And uh, it was determined that that was enough. Uh, even trying to protect the X-15 with ablative coating didn't, didn't help. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, they called it, the first man-made satellite. It was about the size of a big beach ball, and orbiting the Earth, all it did was beep. And that beep told the world, we, the Soviet Union, beat the United States into space. Almost instantly, NACA, became NASA, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The space race, it was called, was on. The next decade would decide which nation would win that race. Our two guests have spent their adult lives in aviation, research, and exploring space.
Our guest, Glenn Bugos and retired Air Force Major General Joe Engel. <laughs> Okay, you want to sit there? <coughs> Afternoon, everybody. Um, just a little bit. Uh, Glenn is a Ph.D. historian uh, for NASA uh, down at the Ames Center. Uh, Ph.D. from Penn, and as you just heard, uh, spends his life doing research about this organization, everything it's done going back to the beginning of NACA. Joe Engel, uh, Air Force F-100 pilot, uh, went to test pilot school. Uh, flew the X-15, as you just saw. He was the, is the youngest ever American astronaut flying the X-15. He was 32 years old when he earned his astronaut wings. He took the X-15 to over 50 miles twice. He's flown over 100, you know, nearly 200 aircraft, 15,000 hours in the air, 9,000 in jets. Flew Apollo back up and commanded two space shuttle flights, STS-2 and STS-51. In STS-2, he is the only commander of a shuttle flight to fly it manually from space to a full stop landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. So those are our two guys. <laughs> All right, thank you, David. <clears throat> Glenn, and first of all, the airplanes. What, what's this airplane, and what's it got to do with NACA? Well, this is a Bell P-63A. Um, it was produced during World War II, um, the only aircraft to have started after the beginning of the war and then introduced uh, into service just prior to the end of the war. Um, it flew at Ames for a year where they were doing some test flights on it. The Commemorative Air Force acquired this aircraft almost uh, 30 years ago, and just recently began refurbishing it to bring it back into flying condition. Uh, so it's now in flying condition. Uh, they made what I thought was a brilliant decision to paint it in the NACA uh, test colors. Um, and you'll see it flying uh, later on this afternoon, I think it's 6 o'clock, um, with this T-38 over here. Uh, the T-38 is the NASA um, astronaut training um, aircraft based down at Johnson uh, Space Center. Tom Parent is the... Uh, NASA pilot who flew it up yesterday um, and will be around later on to talk a little bit about it. But this is an aircraft that uh, General Engel probably flew uh, when he was preparing for his uh, shuttle flights. What, what about this airplane uh, had to do with NACA? I mean, was there a research aspect to it that was not part of the Air Force so much but part of science or uh, new electronics? Yeah, so the, the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, I know a lot of pilots, and this is mostly a pilot audience, know it as NACA, but the people who were living through the NACA called it that. Um, it was started in 1915 as a basic research endeavor, a government civil uh, laboratory to do fundamental research on anything required to improve either military or civilian aviation. So one of the first things they did was some research on propellers, how to make those efficient. Uh, the NACA airfoil series of, um, of, of airfoils that's still very prominently used today was another sort of early research they did, basically understanding the, the, um, the performance of different airfoils so that when an aircraft designer needed a certain type of performance, they could basically go through the catalog and pick it out. So the NACA was doing that sort of fundamental research beginning in 19... 15. In 1917, they added. Sorry. Ford Tri Motor. Yeah. <laughs> no, due respect. Um, they launched the uh, what's now called the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. So uh, a, a research laboratory focused around wind tunnels um, and at the Langley Air, what became Air Force Base, uh, so that they had access to. Um, pretty much every aircraft that the Air Force was flying at the time. So, sorry, this, no, 1939, no. Um, the war was coming. Uh, the NACA was doing great work. All the military services uh, needed more research. The aircraft industry was shifting to the West Coast. So they set up what's called now the NASA Ames Research Center, and then soon after that, a research center in Cleveland, Ohio, now called the NASA Glenn Research Center at the time, the um, Aircraft Engine Research Laboratory, focusing primarily on propulsion. How much of that... Uh, the organization being formed in 1915 had to do with the fact that European, especially French and German, uh, airplane designers and builders were really uh, hustling in terms of, of uh, you know, improving on aircraft flight. 
they were really hustling. They, uh, the Europeans understood much quicker the advantages of aircraft. Of course, flying distances were shorter over there, so they could actually use the aircraft for, for more different things. But it, it also had to do with, um, to a degree, the uh, sort of rampant competitiveness within the American aircraft industry. There were battles over patents. Um, there, it was hard well, to get was one. The rights. That was the rights, right? Correct. Pro protecting their patents, yeah. Yeah, so, in, in, so uh, the United States was behind. It, Absolutely, at the start of World War II, and uh, Congress decided that they needed to establish this civilian uh, aviation research agency to sort of catch up uh, with the Europeans, and we did a great job. I mean, American aircraft, um, you know, reigned supreme through the 20th century, right. in large part because of the fundamental work the NACA did. Yeah, World War One. You just said two, but you meant one, I know. Um, <laughs> but when you come, uh, Sputnik, um, Russians put up Sputnik. And all of a sudden, we see NASA, not NACA. What, what happened, and quickly? Well, what happened, the NACA was not really involved in um, program execution. Um, and it came pretty clear right after Sputnik that that was going to be required. Um, Eisenhower wanted a civilian uh, space program to establish that outer space was civil rather than military terrain. And there wasn't really a civilian research agency that was capable of doing that. The NACA was the best option. Um, so that sort of formed the, the basis of what became NASA, but NASA grew dramatically um, between 1958 and 1962 with the addition of new um, space flight centers, primarily at Johnson, um, at Goddard in Maryland, um, at, at Kennedy in Florida. And the X-15 that Joe flew really uh, dramatized that. So beginning in 1952 thereabouts, the NACA started doing work in space, understanding that there was a continuum between air and space. Um, but it, it was difficult, of course, to do the sort of fundamental research they did because there was no way to, to reach space. So they started launching um, the X-15 program, uh, great success in defining the uh, technology demonstration needs of the aircraft, but when it actually came time to cut the metal, oversee the contract, uh, they really relied on the Air Force to do a lot of that, that work for them. And that sort of uh, symbolized the shift in what the NACA was able to do and what NASA ultimately did. Back to this airplane, the P-39, how much is the P-39, which I guess sitting over here, how much is the P-39 like this airplane, if at all? Well, it's fairly similar. I mean, if you look at them, uh, you know, just sort of side by side, you'll see that that's got a, a three-prop um, on the front. Um, it does not have the laminar flow wings. There's no ventral fin in the back. Uh, the tail on this is is straight, whereas in the P-39, it's, it's curved. So th uh, what happened was Bell introduced this. This, I think, was the, the um, third major aircraft that they uh, had developed after they were established in Buffalo, New York. And they were still trying to get their feel for how to make a, a good aircraft. They, they introduced the P-39, but it almost immediately became clear that there were some issues with it. There was a need for it. The primary problem was with its spin uh, characteristics. So um, the laminar flow airfoil had just been introduced in the, the P-51. That was some research that had been done at Langley that was transferred um, to North America. And, and so they decided that the, a basic good airframe on the, the P-39 just needed to be made a little bit larger. The aerodynamics needed to be refined a little bit more. So in introducing that, they made a number of other um, uh, small changes to the aircraft, but they're very similar. So Joe, did you ever fly the P-39? I did. Uh, I got, got to fly it uh, with the Confederate Air Force down in, in Harlingen. I didn't ever fly the P-63, and I was curious. Greg, have you ever been up on the wing and watched them start up the, the airplane, the P-63? I, you know, I haven't, no. I, I tell you, I, re I remember the, my checkout in the P-39 was, how would you like to go fly the King Cobra, or the, fly the Air Cobra? And I thought, boy, you bet, anything. You know, anything you let me fly. And they said, okay, well, so and so will go out and help you get it started, and then you go ahead and take it around the pattern, get a good feel for it, and then go do what you want. And I remember the guy said, "Okay, now whatever you do, don't don't put your hand, your fingers, in between the, the instrument panel and the frame around the instrument panel. You know how, how the panel sits structurally uh, to the to the airframe on the airplane." And um, and it was kind of a rushed, get it started and get it out of here before somebody sees you going going to go fly it. And so uh, I said, okay, and started this startup technique. And you know, you're, you're, 
when you start an airplane engine, in, in, your, your right hand's pretty busy with the th mixture and the th th throttle setting and the prop setting and all this stuff over here. Your, your right hand doesn't have much to do until it comes time to bring the throttle in and keep get off the primer pump and bring the throttle in. And, and then your, your right hand is busy and your left hand doesn't have much to do. So you kind of brace yourself up there while you find where everything is in the cockpit. And I remember the P-39 when I started it up, I remember not to put my hand, my fingers in between the panel and the, and the frame. But I, I saw the reason with the engine in the back and the powertrain, the gearing and the powertrain, the, the powertrain comes forward, the gear drops down below the pilot, runs up between your legs and then back up in line with the with the prop. And and so the powertrain is, you know, going through a, a maze there to get up to the prop. And uh, that sets up vibration at, at certain RPM, really good vibration. And, and I remember hearing the rattling first, and I thought something, they didn't, must not have gotten a panel on right or something, and looked up and, and the instrument panel was just shaking every which direction. And I, I looked at where I normally would put my fingers up there to brace myself while I was doing other things. And it was just banging back and forth. It would chop the ends of your fingers off when it was good. I wondered if they fixed that on the, on the 63. Uh, <laughs> I would hope so. We can ask the pilot that question. Um, Let's do that. Yeah, yeah I do yeah. know that the engine went and through it. count his fingers? <laughs> yes. The engine went through a lot of uh, uh, changes between the P-39 <laughs> and the 63 as well with the, uh, the supercharger to give it some high altitude performance. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully that, that all uh, was fixed. Before we get the X-15, which we'll talk about in more detail, uh, Joe F-100s, uh, Air Force fighter pilot. Right. Right. Good old solid airplane. Good fighter. Right. Birch Day, it was a good airplane. And you're out in the area of Edwards Air Force Base, right? <laughs> Right. And tell me what happened that day. You were th <laughs> three of your buddies. Well, I knew what, I knew you were going to you're going to nail me on that. Oh and, yeah. Uh, every fighter pilot thinks he's the world's greatest fighter pilot. If he if he doesn't feel that way, you shouldn't be in the cockpit in the first place. But I I was a young lieutenant at George Air Force Base, and Chuck Yeager was the was the squadron commander of another squadron there along the flight line. The squadron right next to ours on the flight line. And um, our, our ops officer was named Don Wosky. Both Don and Chuck were excellent fighter pilots. Uh, you all know Chuck by reputation. Don Wosky was just about as good as Chuck and, and could really fly an airplane, you know, fly a fighter, and knew how to dogfight. And I, I had been given my first flight of four. I was a flight commander as a, you know, as a first lieutenant. That was a really big deal to have a flight of four airplanes, you know, two on one side, another on the other, taking off and going out to the, the de where, you, where you practice dogfighting and stuff. And so I was leading the flight out, just determined that I was going to make a real good mark for myself in the squadron and in the wing and on the base there, because I had this shot at being a flight lead. So we went out in finger formation and I spread the flight out and we were, we were looking around and stuff. And I saw a couple of airplanes coming in from the northeast and um, so I, I waggled, waggled the wings to bring the guys in and kept radios quiet and gave them the sign to spread out into, into fight, fighting four, two elements that went too high and too low. And uh, uh, so when I was sure everybody had these two airplanes, they were F-100s and they were coming up from Nellis, we figured. And we figured, I figured I'd get up in the sun and then split split the element off and go in and I'd take the lead airplane and the second element would take the second and we had everything going for us. The sun was just right, the sky was blue and, and you wouldn't lose sight of those two bogeys down there. And the bogeys turned out to be Chuck Yeager and Don Wosky. They had been up to Nellis to arrange for their two squadrons to go up and do some gunnery training at Nellis Air Force Base Range. So I, cause I was coming in and, and it, my, my element was coming in and we had it nailed and I thought, boy, I wish, I wish we had a God's eye camera to film this. I could show it all, e all afternoon when I get back to ready room. And all of a sudden, these two airplanes that I was coming in on and my wingman just broke and disappeared and went back kind of behind me. And I thought, what the heck happened? And I looked around and, and uh, I, I saw a bunch of airplanes behind me and after maneuvering a while, I heard what you don't ever want to hear on a radio was guns, guns, and that was Jaeger 
very quietly in his in his West Virginia drawl, saying, "Guns, guns, again," you know. And uh, Yeager had seen me flying, climbing into the sun. He was all set up, and he and Waski were ready for when I came in. And and uh, and his and Waski was ready for the second element. They just cleaned our tail that day, and it took me a long while to get confidence to get back up in <laughs> into the dogfight area again. <laughs> But it led to an important relationship, didn't it? Oh, it did. It did. I became very close friends with Chuck and learned a lot from him. Uh, he, was, he was a great aviator. He was a good, great pilot. So is that the point where you went to test pilot school or soon after that? It wasn't too long after that, as a matter of fact, which kind of surprised me. I figured I, I'd really screwed that one up and I'd take a while to recover. But it wasn't too long after that I had this, the number of hours that it took, it required to get your application into the test pilot school, which I believe at the time was 1,500 hours of high performance time. What happens at TPS and how long does it take? Uh, it takes a, about a year. Uh, it takes a little over a year now, but that's because they've extended the curriculum and, and made it kind of a space pilot course as well as test pilot course. So uh, is that true for you? It was also space at the time? I beg pardon? It was a space program for you at the time? It was not at the time. I, oh. I graduated from the, the uh, turf test pilot school and was assigned to fighter test operations there at Edwards, which was the best assignment you could get, and uh, felt very lucky. And then about two years later, they, they decided to have this uh, aerospace research pilot school course, which was primarily space rendezvous, rendezvous dynamics, and... Uh, Learning about how to fly in a zero gravity environment. So, what happened then? Did you go to NASA, or uh, did you come back to Edward? What was the trajectory for you? I, I um, when I graduated from uh, aerospace research pilot school, Mike Collins and I were very close friends, and and we were in the same class, aerospace research pilot school class. They'd, they'd taken selected test pilots back for the early classes, and. Uh, uh, Charlie Bassett was in that class as well. We, everybody, NASA was, had announced that they were gonna select another group of astronauts. And so, of course, that was the thing to do then, was to go to the moon. Um, and I applied along with Mike and Charlie and all the guys in the class. And uh, a couple of weeks after we turned our applications in, I had, I was told, I was in fighter ops, getting ready to go flying, he said, General Branch wants you to report to his office this afternoon. And much as, and so I did. I, of course I did. I mean, hell, two stars, it's, you know, I'd like to see in my office. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what I'd done wrong, because when you had to go see the general, generally, you, you had really messed up doing something. And uh, so I went up and, and uh, I knocked, and he told me to enter, and I walked in. And he was going through some papers by design, and, and <coughs> And uh, I, I uh, was standing at attention, and he said, uh, go on, sit down. I want to talk to you about something. And so I sat down, and he said, well, he said, I got your application here. I see you've applied for the next uh, group of astronauts for NASA. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I, I think I'm going to disapprove that for now. And he just took an application and tore it in half <laughs> and laid it down on his desk. And it caught me completely off guard. I didn't know what to do. And so I was standing there kind of awkwardly, probably scratching where I shouldn't have been scratching. He says, okay, that's all I got for you. You so didn't I, cry or anything, did you? Huh? You didn't cry or something? Not then. Not <laughs> <laughs> I, but I did, I did go out. And, and he said, I got something else in mind for you. I didn't know it at the time, and I didn't know it until about two weeks later that, that I had been selected to fly the X-15. I was going to take Bob White's place who was transferring to a squadron in Germany. So um, to be honest, I, I, I was happy as a lark. Uh, to fly the X-15 at that point in time, and even up to today, was, was uh, to me, I think, one of the greatest things that could have happened. Uh, um, so talk about the X-15. Um, what was the purpose of the flights and the capability of the airplane, and what was learned? The, the 
generally, and, and God help, help me out on this, but the general purpose, the objective of the X-15 was to expand both the speed and the altitude flight envelope. Um, uh, speed envelope included aerodynamic heating that would begin to occur as you increased Mach numbers and as you got into the hypersonic. Hypersonic, incidentally, I learned later, a lot later, meant anything around Mach 5 or above. And it's kind of like where to space start. You know, it kind of depends on where you run out of stick control and have to go to reaction controls. But, but uh, aerodynamic heating becomes a serious problem depending on the material that the aircraft is made out of or the engine is made out of. And, and it's sometimes a limiting factor, your speed factor. In the F-104, for example, there's about 2.2 Mach number that the, the uh, leading uh, turbine face in, uh, temperatures would get up high enough that they would, they would uh, structurally affect the, the, t the blades in the turbine. So you were limited, and, and you had a temperature light that would come on that would say that's your, your, your uh, T1 temperature is high enough, you can't go any faster. Did you fly that airplane, the 104? Yes, yes. Right. Quite a bit. At Edwards, there were, no, there were a number of F-104s because they made a great chase airplanes. They had a, a lot of speed and altitude capability, uh, and we put that to good use. Now, there were only 12 of you who flew the X-15, but there was only, what, two airplanes? How many were there? There were three, three? actually. Yeah, we, we managed to keep bending them up in, in uh, one way or another so that there's normally only two of them airborne at a time. Well, in all fairness, one of them blew up on a test stand, a thrust test stand, where you measure how much thrust each, each engine actually has, and had a faulty shutoff valve, and it, it ex ended up in explosion. Um, was somebody in the cockpit? Was that? Yeah, yeah. Bob Rushworth was in the cockpit then. Or I'm sorry, Scott Crossfield Scott was Crossfield. in the cockpit. And uh, in a business suit. He wasn't even, didn't even have his flight suit on. He just, because an engine run, you know, you then you, you finish the engine run early in the morning and you go to work at your office. So he had his suit on. And um, I don't know whether, he, whether that suit was any good after the, that fire or not. <laughs> He probably wore it, cause Scott, but, but Scott was a good dresser. I shouldn't say that. But, um, yeah, Scott didn't get hurt at all, though. He didn't get injured at all. The airplane was blown apart after the fuselage and blew about 20 or 30 feet forward on the ramp, and uh, he got out of it. And uh, uh, he also had a landing where uh, the engine shut down early on, very early in the powered flights. He had a lot of fuel left on board, and he couldn't get rid of all the fuel. And so it was, it was heavy when he touched down. The nose slapped down and broke the fuselage right behind the cockpit again. Mm -hmm. Jack McKay had an emergency landing on Mud Lake that ended up rolling the airplane. The gear failed, and, and he ended up rolling the airplane. So those airplanes were out for a while, out of, out of flying condition. But they all came back and flew again. Right. Since there were so few of those airplanes, did they all have the same size cockpit? Yes. <laughs> How tall are you? I was six one, a little, almost six one and a half, when I was flying. Because Pete Richard. Knight was what five six maybe? Oh, seven on a good day with high heels. Was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the the important thing was Scott Scott Crossfield uh, had left NACA to go work as the as the uh, pilot during the design effort of the X-15 for NASA, for NACA. And Scott was was very instrumental in placement of all the controls and the gauges and the dials and everything in the cockpit, and the layout of the entire cockpit. And I gotta say that Scott did one excellent job. I mean, that was a beautiful job. You'd, you'd crawl in that airplane and, and sit down and start you know, waiting for people to strap you in or get strapped in. And so you kind of just instinctively, you know, say, well, okay, well, here's the throttle, here's, here's the stick, and everything was right where you would want it, and right where you would instinctively reach to get it, and it, it just felt really, really good. Um, for me, it was a little too good because, I mean, everything was really there, close in where you wanted it, because, as you mentioned, Scott was 5'9", I was 6'1 and a half, so 
I was really crowded. I kind of had to double up my knees a little bit and scrunch my shoulders in because nothing adjusted in an experimental airplane then. Rudder pedals didn't adjust. The seat didn't adjust. Um, so you, you got what you climbed in to get it. When you climbed up the ladder and got in that airplane, you, that was what you got. And, and I just felt cramped as heck. And in fact, the canopy, when it came down, the, the canopy wrapped around your head down to your shoulders and it and it held your helmet in place so your head didn't bang around uh, if the airplane went out of control and uh, and then the fuselage came up and started over your shoulder so there was just no room in that airplane at all and uh, I can every time I got in that airplane I can remember saying thanks a lot Scotty I mean you little short <laughs> devil you, you built the airplane just right for you but uh, for for myself and the larger guys with a spacesuit on also it was a very crowded, and very cramped airplane. So how did Pete, as, as you know, diminutive as he was, how, how did, could he reach the pedals? No. There were some uh, very intuitive and in, in, in inventive things done out there at Edwards. They were really, they were a good bunch of ground crew. That was, that was the best team of, of uh, experimental airplanes I'd, I've, ever team, I've ever teamed up with. No, there there wasn't much time when Pete got in and said, I, I can't get full full rudder pedal throw out of this. They they went over and they got some two by four blocks of wood and, and wired them around the, the bar, the rudder bar, so that Pete could reach the rudders and get full throw. And on the throttle, he actually, Pete shut down too, too late, actually. He went a little over speed, over sped a little bit and said, I, I reached forward for the throttle and I couldn't reach it because the four G's were pushing me back and and the throttle was was right out there and I, I just couldn't reach out and get it and I thought that's a great I'm going to remember that line when I'm going for an altitude flight but he he uh, but they also fixed that they put a little a little lever on the uh, on the uh, throttle they came back two and a half inches so Pete could reach the throttle at full throttle. <laughs> When you, as I recall, we were in Dayton or someplace, or maybe it was Air and Space, there was an X-15 there? There was. And uh -huh. you, as I recall, you went and climbed in, didn't you? I got to climb in. It. They, they were moving the number two airplane from the, from the research hangar over to the new hangar number four at the Air Force, uh, Air, uh, Air Force Museum at, at Dayton. And uh, uh, they had asked us to come up. They'd asked me to come up if I'd like to come up there and be there for the, you know, towing it across the runway and into the hangar. And I said, well, sure, I'd, can, I, can I get in it and just for old time's sake? And they said, no, I don't think so because it's a Smithsonian Museum piece now and, and I don't know the ground rules, but you probably do. Yeah. You, you're not supposed to let anybody in, in. I knew that, but I really wanted to get in the airplane again. And I was talking to this young lady and I'd, said, well, look, it, you're going to tow it over to the hangar, right? And tow it in the hangar? And she said, that's, that's correct. I said, well, could I sit in it while you're towing it? And, and she said, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but, but that's a nice thought. And I said, well, now, wait a minute. There's an Air Force regulation. Whenever you're towing an airplane, you got to have somebody in the cockpit on the brakes. And uh, she acknowledged that, yeah, that was true. I said, well, let's, let's use that. Let's say... <laughs> <laughs> and the, she, I don't think, appreciated that the X-15 doesn't have brakes. It doesn't have wheels. <laughs> it's, it's got skids back there that just get slowed down for friction. But I was ready to get on the bar and tow it, tow break it over. So I did get to get in the airplane, and I, I was really neat. I, I thought I was there two or three minutes, and Jeannie, my wife, was up there with me, and she said, at, th at 30 minutes, people wanted to leave and go home, so she started pointing to her watch. <laughs> but it was a great, great time. Great memories came back from that. Back to flying it. Can you describe what it's like to go 5.6, I guess, Mach? I mean, dealing with those kinds of speeds, and how do you have the reflexes to deal with those speeds and know where you are? And well, you, it, it, it's that's a good question, David. And you you just end up having to to get in the habit of thinking way out ahead of the airplane and and seeing and picking up uh, inputs early when they're still small. Can't wait till the end and make very sharp, very big inputs because. It's just like any high-speed airplane. You have to think farther and farther ahead of the airplane and 
and keep the in minimum keep the input system. It's like like riding in a uh, riding a really good high spirited fast high jumping horse. You know you don't you don't want to over control it and wait till you get to the fence to pull the reins. Uh, you, you want to lead it way ahead with just little nudges, the tiny nudges, and make sure you're doing the right thing and keeping ahead of it. So when you get to those speeds and altitudes, what direction are you going? I mean, are you, are you always going up? Do you go straight? Do you gain speeds going down? What? Um, there were two basic profiles that we flew in the X-15 and the variances on, on both of them, of course. But one was a heating or a high speed or high Mach number profile where you would launch at 45,000 feet, pull, pull up to about 30 degrees nose high, push over so that you leveled out somewhere between 100 and 110 and 120,000 feet, and then accelerate on out to the conditions that the engineers or the, the flight designers had wanted data to be collected from at that time, whether it was a dynamic pressure or a Mach number or a thermal number. Um, and then throttle or bank to stabilize at that condition and, and pull in. Maybe at Mach 5, the objective was to run an angle of attack sweep, get some data at different angles of attack at Mach 5. And so at that, to keep all the other conditions level, you'd leave a throttle up, bank it, and turn in and pull some Gs, pull an angle of attack, and set an angle of attack, and then make pilot inputs either disturb the airplane either directionally with the rudders or longitudinally with the with the stick dependent working with the engineers to develop maneuvers that would extract the most meaningful parameters or make it easy for them to extract the flight parameters that they wanted when i mentioned you went over fifth over 50 miles in altitude mm -hmm. twice are you so busy that you can't look out the window i mean do you can you recall what the it Earth looked like from that altitude. <laughs> on on the speed on the speed missions, the, the answer is pretty much yes. You were just you were just locked on to to the instruments to make sure that you kept whatever the parameters were within the limits that you wanted. The altitude flights were a little different in that we would launch again at forty five thousand feet from the from the uh, B fifty two. We would pull up to about forty five degrees angle pitch angle. And and uh, burn either to a time or to burnout until fuel was depleted, and it would shut down generally about 140,000 feet going uphill, and you'd then you'd have about three three minutes four minutes maybe of zero g time of ballistic float time over the top, where you were high enough so that the aerodynamic surfaces really didn't have any control at all. Not even any trim effect, uh, you know, to try to trim the, trim the airplane back to a condition. Um, and so you're ballistic over the top. And we did have things that we were running, experiments that we were running, ultraviolet and infrared spectrum uh, photography experiments, photographing through shock waves at, at uh, targets on the ground. Um, and, and those were the flights that you had time to look out the window for a few seconds at a time. Not very long, though, but nothing compared to the space shuttle where you could sit over there and look at the Earth all day long with your mouth open. <laughs> the, uh, so if you run out of fuel, then do you begin, or pretty soon to begin, a re-entry pattern to come back in? Uh, well, you, you've got about, we, we had about three, maybe four minutes of ballistic time over the top until you would start start to fall back into the atmosphere and and your your job at that time the most critical thing then was to make sure that the airplane was lined up the the x-axis was lined up with your flight path in other words you were heading right back to edwards if if you got a call from the ground they had radar tracking on the ground and they that was about the only instrumentation that we had on the airplane really was the ground bob rushworth on the ground watching the ground track and watching the profiles and he'd say, you know, you're you're on ground track, or you're a little right, or a little left, and you know, on profile. And then which direction from Edwards were you coming back to Edwards? We're normally, e we had two tracks on the high range, either from straight north from Tonopah or Mud Lake, and then one from the northeast, which which was basically over Nellis or Las Vegas, back to Edwards. But both of them launched with the airplane pointed toward Edwards, so that if you lost. Uh, uh, if you lost track of, of what your flight path was and what your, 
you know, where you, you didn't have any sense of whether you're going sideways or not. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that we could do was to fly the ground track in an F-104 and pull up as high as we could get, let the nose drop down, and see where it where it went through, where the nose dropped through the horizon, like at Mount Baldy or Cajon Pass or, or one of those mountain mountain passes uh, near San Bernardino. That was always a good gouge. That if you could, if you lost track of where you were pointed head, you know, direction wise, just let the nose drop through and, and find out where Cajon Pass was and kick it over and, and then bring it down that way. Then you'd be close enough to where, when the dynamic pressure started to build up then you could tweak it down to a zero degree side slip. Did anybody ever carry too much speed going back into Edwards and overshoot? Well, not so much too much speed, but, but Neil, Neil Armstrong on an altitude flight, uh, the technique that we would use coming back in would be to, to set up uh, a first an attitude of the airplane. We went out at 45 degree angle and so therefore, ballistically, you'd come back in at 45 degree angle. The ideal entry angle of attack was 26 degrees angle of attack. So that, that meant you wanted about 20 degrees nose down, the difference between the 25 and the 45. So you would let the nose come to the horizon and then kind of eyeball about 20 degrees down and hold that attitude until the nose ball started to pick up enough dynamic pressure that it would tell you what your angle of attack was. Then you'd go to 25 degree angle of attack and then until you built up 5 G's, hold 5 G's until you got 1500 feet a second and then kind of push the nose over at 1500 feet a second still coming down so that you'd continue to go into the more dense atmosphere and, and you could use speed brakes and maneuver to control your energy to end up over the field. If you didn't do that you, you would bounce back up into the thin air and then you'd kind of lose, you wouldn't have the capability to turn the airplane at all. And that happened to Neil on one, one flight. He got distracted with an, with an anomaly, with, a, with an emergency during the pullout and he, he held the five Gs a little too long and started putting him back up. And he ended up down, down over uh, Burbank. At what altitude about? I don't Could remember. anybody see him? Oh, no, you couldn't see him. Down at Disney Studios, look up and see him. <laughs> I don't know whether he broke any windows. I don't think he did with a sonic boom, but but he, uh, no, you couldn't see the airplane. Uh, they couldn't have given him any help anyway. He he just saw where he was and, and as quickly as he could got the airplane turned around, hit it right toward Edwards and held the angle of attack for maximum lift to drag or maximum distance for glide and, uh, and uh, wrote it out. He came in from... Normally we'd circle, do a circling approach and come in and land from the north or northeast. Pete came straight from Burbank. I mean, you could draw, draw a line from Burbank, California to the south edge of the lake bed. And that's, that's what uh, Neil flew. And uh, he just made it back. Uh, uh, when he was putting the gear down as he came across the lake bed, there were cactus already up in, in view. But he did a great job, a great airmanship. Wow. Um. How significant was the X-15 in terms of our space program, uh, development of techniques for space? It, it, it was, in fairness, uh, much more valuable and dependent uh, and, and uh, helped out when we got ready to fly the space shuttle first than it was for the capsules, for the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo capsules. Because the capsules would come in basically ballistically. You didn't, you, you could, you, it had, they had a little bit of a lift vector, but not, not very much. And um, you, you could not affect, down, you couldn't affect the range too much or the cross range too much with them. The, now the space shuttle was designed with a wing that you could land it subsonically. And so with that wing, while you were still at higher Mach numbers, you had quite a bit of capability to go to bank one way or the other to affect cross range if you weren't coming in lined up with the runway to land you, you could you could make 15 or 20 degree azimuth changes with uh, with the lift to drag that we had and you could extend your range by keeping the wings level or you could shorten the range by banking over 90 degrees and getting down into higher drag configuration really 
But if I could say a word on behalf of the engineers, um, the X-15 was, uh, whenever you start a flight test program, there are things you expect to find and things you find that you didn't expect to find. And uh, hypersonics really uh, is defined not so much by the speed, though most people recognize it as Mach 5, but really where aerothermodynamic effects become important, that is, the aircraft structure is getting so hot that things happen to it that are unexpected. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the people at NASA thought that the X-15 was really the only chance they had to um, understand, you know, expansion, contraction, thermodynamic effects, bonding aluminum with the ablative materials that they had um, on the aircraft, um, understanding how speed propagates uh, uh, around the aircraft and how to, what other sort of shock waves would develop as you get an aircraft to that speed. What I think they really learned by having pilots on board, though, is that things really are different when you're in near zero G environment. And uh, they ha had reaction engines on, um, on the aircraft, um, but it was really how the pilots were using them, where they really learned a great deal about how uh, the astronauts working in the ballistic capitals were going to be able to, to handle the aircraft. So Joe, that brings up you, now you, you and Dick Truly, and who else did the... Uh, John Young and Bob Crippen, we did the first session on it. Crippen Young, yeah, with the, the shuttle. Tell us about those tests and how confident you were the first time the 747 pulled away and left you with no <laughs> engines. Well, we, we punched Fitz Fulton off. We, we punched him off and we yelled Fitz away over the radio. And then Fitz was flying the 747 that was carrying the <laughs> shuttle. And Fitz is well known to all of you. I know he is, he is a legend in flight test community and the airplane community. But uh, yeah, we, uh, that was a very, choreo a very closely choreographed maneuver where, where Fitz would climb as high as he could with the 747, push over and accelerate slightly till we got up to 240 knots. We had to have 240 knots in order to have enough lift on the orbiter, on the, on the space shuttle, to lift and clear the tail of the 747 without just sliding back and shearing the tail off, which we, every, we both agreed, Fitz and I agreed, that would have been per, poor form to do something like that. So Fitz, Fitz would push over, and when he got on speed, he would call on speed. We would be ready to push the button to, to fire the bolts to, to uh, clear us. We would pull up and to the right. Fitz would dump the spoilers chop the power and dive off to the left. He looked like a J-87 going into a power dive bomb and with that 740, with the, uh, with the uh, 747. And, uh, and we, would, we would come off so that we had both vertical separation and lateral separation as we slowed down and fell down behind him because we didn't want to come down in, in his wash either. So it was a, it was a... And what altitude was this when you were... About 20,000 feet in the final configuration with the tail cone off. So what did that first time you did that, what did, how, how did it feel? Uh, it, well, there weren't any surprises, really. Uh, yeah. we, we had become accustomed to, to really being in a, in a very busy mode or being ready for a very busy mode because there was a lot of flight test maneuvers. We worked very closely with the flight test engineers to again, as we did in the X-15, develop what kind of motions they would like the airplane to go through as far as disturbing its stable level flight and seeing how quickly it would recover and how effective the control surfaces were. So they, we worked very closely with them to determine what kind of inputs we could make for them to get the most data or to most easily withdraw the parameters that they needed to understand what capabilities of the airplane were, both CG, lateral, left and right CG capabilities were, and cross-range capabilities of the airplane were. How many of these tests did you do, if you remember? Um, let's see, we did, uh, on the, on the uh, approach and landing tests, I think we did 20-some 20, 20 oh, wow. uh, in yeah. a two-minute flight. And, uh, and on the entry from orbit, we did, uh, I think, 31 or 32 during the entry from orbit. The T-38, at times, I think they used for practice right. uh, shuttle landings. What would they do in the T-38 to simulate what you just described? The, the, most, the, most, the, the biggest value of the T-38 was that we could get very close to the same lift-to-drag ratio or the same glide ratio as the space shuttle. Uh, 
in, in, its, in its entry configuration. Uh, so we could practice, uh, the manu practice the profile from 20 or 30,000 feet to touchdown, all the way to touchdown, and uh, deviate from that if we had to, to simulate either a problem or an emergency or getting a data maneuver to see, to, to really just get so familiar with those profiles looking out the window that the profile was instinctive. You, you almost didn't have to look out the window. You could hit high key and set it up and check it again at the 90 degree point and check it again 20 to 20 degrees to go and then final approach get locked on. But it was, it, it was so valuable in a, teaching us energy management around the pattern uh, without having to concentrate on it to allow us to concentrate on other systems to make sure that nothing was going wrong, hydraulic system and whatever, and uh, and and also just just to fly it and concentrate on flying the airplane rather than manage it. And on to the shuttle. Uh, you commanded the second shuttle flight. Mm -hmm. um, how much time did you spend in the simulator before you actually flew? A lot. I uh, I really don't know how much time, David. But we were we were, we were very fortunate in that there were some delays in the in the shuttle being ready for its fl first flight. And since we were already named as the crew for the, the second flight and backup for the first flight, we had unlimited time in the simulators and we, we took advantage of it because it sure beat sitting reading books about hydraulic systems <laughs> or electric systems. But, and and uh, yeah, and, and one more thing I wanted to say about, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, the, the value of a hypersonic um, learning about hypersonic shock waves, their effect on impingement thermally on leading edges of wings or tail surfaces, or or their effect on the control controllability too. Because behind that shock wave, it's a different air pressure than it is in front of it, and so the effect of that surface you've got behind there quite often has decreased some. So we, we learned a whole bunch about that. Uh, and, and a very fun, interesting thing, I went to uh, Texas A&M. Our daughter uh, graduated from there, and, and uh, I was invited to come and see the new Mach 5, the new hypersonic wind tunnel uh, facility that they have at Texas A&M at, at College Station. And there was a, a young graduate lady who had built a 3D model of the X-15 with that scramjet engine mounted on the, on the lower fin. And... Uh, she, while I was there, they set it up and, and, and ran the model. It was about that, it was just six, seven inches long. They ran a Mach 5 or Mach 5.7 simulation in this wind tunnel. And she showed me, well, she watched, we watched as the thermal temperatures built up with coloration real time. And at it, and it, it, it exactly the spot where that lower fin got burned off, this little red spot came up and then it turned to kind of a purple. And she said, well, that's where your failure would happen, I'll bet. And, um, and you know, it, it amazed me. I mean, she, in 10, 15 seconds, she had duplicated what we found out in about six months out there, uh, almost, dr almost uh, drastically. And I was kidding her the rest of the afternoon. I said, where the hell were you 50 years ago when we could have used you? <laughs> So the shuttle flight. When you any surprises in that flight? Uh, no, not really. I think early on in the shuttle flight, the gains of the flight control system had to be tweaked and, and tuned to match what the airplane was really seeing. We ran into as the airplane would uh, reverse roll back and forth to manage energy coming back. At the end of the roll reversals, uh, there was an oscillation that would damp out after a number of oscillations, but it was there. And, and any oscillation or anything that you have at Mach 17 is concerned, and uh, because it can very easily go divergent and then burn burn the airplane up, as we learned. So I mentioned earlier that you were the only shuttle commander to land manually from orbit, in this case, to land at Edwards. Um, right. Describe that experience, and that was that was neat. That was fun and rewarding because, you know, y'all are pilots, and I don't care whether you got an autopilot in your airplane or not. They come in handy 
especially on long cross countries and stuff. But when you're in a landing pattern and you want to you want to land or you want to maneuver around, you want to do the flying. You don't want any black box doing the flying for you. And we were the same way, although the the, the management at JSC was very, very adamant about uh, the autopilot being engaged and, and flying the airplane during entry. And they conceded that, yeah, if you guys are insist on landing it, you could take it over at high key to get used to the airplane, to start communicating with the airplane, so you know about how hard you have to kick the horse to make it go. Uh, and and so they take, the, the standard procedure was to take over at about Mach 2 overhead, and that way you could, you could feel the airplane out as you came around to land. So when you flared and floated in the touchdown, you didn't over control or under control the airplane and end up with a hard landing. How much of this What's been more fun in your flying career and all this incredible experience you've had? <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel so blessed. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I look back and I don't, there's nothing I wanted, would want to do other than to fly. And, and uh, especially with the opportunities that I have had, and I, I readily admit that I've been very, very lucky. Glenn? Uh, how, how much do you enjoy listening to somebody who speaks your language? <laughs> well, uh, very fortunate. I mean, it's great to be able to be in a position where I can listen to, you know, the wisdom that Joe's collected over the years and capture that and make it available to future generations of explorers. Uh, you always learn something when you're talking with the individuals who actually uh, did the flying. I mean, just sitting here today, I was surprised at uh, the sort of things Joe was talking about, the, the care, the attention to the parameters, the connecting with the, uh, the, the engineers that are, are directing the, the, the test flight um, to sort of make sure that all the data is gathered to move the, the, the technology forward. I think uh, the way you're talking ab about the way that you're preparing for your flights is exactly the same way that the test pilots you know, who are flying the P-63 or the, the T-38 would have approached their work as well. Right. Connie Bolin, who are you? I am right, oh, you're here. right here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, oh, there's Connie. Uh, you've got an opportunity now, ladies and gentlemen, to, through Connie, uh, ask questions of both of these gentlemen about these airplanes or about the space program, whatever you would like. And um, Joe Engel, Glenn Bugos, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you. Connie, what? Yeah, no, I'm sorry, Joe. We're, no, I can't ahead. say anything Wait, more? No, 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 no more. No, please, okay. Joe, please. <laughs> No, I was just going to say that, that, that you made it, you emphasized the point that a, a lot of people feel that test pilots generally are just wild, crazy, th that they are wild and crazy, but they're, that they want to just get in the airplane, push the throttle as far forward and go till you run out of gas and see how much you can get out of the airplane. And, and in, a, in a flight test program, that's really not the case. You, you really are useless if that's your mindset or your, your attitude. Uh, the only way that you're going to contribute to make airplanes better or to make them safer is to sit down and communicate with the engineering community, with the engineers and the, and the programmers, and find out what kind of data incrementally you need to expand that envelope so you can study. You can see, you can be warned when you're getting into areas that aren't where you ought to be flying. And, um, and, and so that really there's, it, it's necessary to be, from, to be a good test pilot, I feel anyway, it's necessary to, unfortunately, to be very disciplined and work very closely with, with guys who will design the profile. You fly that profile as closely as you can, even though you got the, the ability with more fuel, more throttle, more thrust to go higher or go faster. Very, very good point. Thank you, Joe. And along those lines, if it weren't for the crew chiefs and the people who maintain these airplanes, we would not be able to get in those airplanes and push the throttle forward with great confidence that they were going to go. Absolutely. So, and uh, Bud Anderson has uh, pointed that out on, on many occasions, how important the ground crews are. And I think you can look around these grounds here and you can see all the Warbird members who are not aircraft owners. You do not have to own an aircraft to be a member of Warbirds of America because it takes a lot of people to preserve this history and keep the airplanes going. So thank you for bringing that up, Joe. That's, uh, that's perfect. Uh, Tom, have you been uh, introduced, uh, the uh, T-38 oh, yeah. pilot here? Uh, come on up, just uh, come on, Tom. Please Let's embarrass Tom, you. Tom Parent, who flies this T-38 for NASA. I, I, I think uh, 
Let me see. I think we should swap rides here. You know, I might be able to get you on a Mustang if you get me that 38, Tom. Can All we right, work I'll, on that? I'll go with you first. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I'll go with you first right there. Tell us a little bit about the T-38 that you brought here today. We thank NASA for, uh, for your being, being here. Okay, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Tom Perrin. I'm from uh, Houston, Texas, Johnson Space Center. Uh, we were asked to bring this aircraft up to support uh, today's event. We're glad, uh, very glad to do so. Uh, this aircraft is a 1966 model T-38. Uh, it's the same one that uh, General Engel had flown back in the day when he was uh, flying these uh, at NASA. Uh, it's a little different than the Air Force version. NASA has done a lot of modifications to it. Uh, it's a supersonic jet trainer designed to uh, initially train uh, fighter pilots in the Air Force to go out and fly F-4s, F-102s, you know, the Century Series types of fighters. Uh, we find it works very good for astronaut training. Uh, so all our astronauts are trained in this, whether they're military jet pilots or scientists, engineers, doctors that are coming on uh, to fly as mission specialists. Uh, we put them in this aircraft and, and they learn what it takes to operate in a high performance aircraft, uh, dynamic maneuvering, working together as a crew uh, so that they can take those uh, same skill sets up uh, with them to space. So with the first time they rock it up on a, a Soyuz or uh, hopefully a US made rocket here pretty soon, uh, they'll have a background of, of uh, working with the crew and, and working through problems together to get the mission safely done. Thank you, Tom, and, and thank you for being here. Uh, Glad to be here. Uh, Mo, do we have uh, a gentleman in the audience to tell us about the, uh, the P-63? And thank you to the Dixie Wing for having uh, this aircraft here that was so recently uh, restored. And as we do that, I'm going to task uh, the cameraman to see how good you are, Rich. There uh, is a panel open on this side of the airplane that I would like for everybody to be able to see. It was interesting enough that I uh, watched General uh, Engel walk over there earlier and say, wow, you know, this, yeah. is, uh, this is pretty neat over here. So, um, Bo, did you find somebody? Come tell us about your airplane. Come on out. Um, actually, yeah, I'm, my name is Craig. The, the pilot of the airplane is that's flying this aircraft. I'm flying the, uh, the Silver 63. So if uh, Mark would come over and take this microphone from me, that'd be a, a way better thing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mark, uh, so we're on the, on the fly here. The, you guys brought this up from Georgia and the other P-63s. Come on over, Mark, to uh, introduce yourself and, uh, and tell us a little bit about the history of this airplane. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? Well, uh, this P-63 in particular here, it's uh, owned by the Commander of Air Force. Um, it's been with the uh, CEF for, uh, oh, since I believe it was the early 70s. Uh, they flew it for several years. Uh, someone had donated it to the CEF. They flew it for a little while. Um, it was in need of some uh, restoration work. So after, I believe, about 75, it went into storage. And uh, over the years, they finally started getting it going. And uh, we just got it flying this past year. The, uh, the test on the side there, that's actually something this aircraft wore um, in uh, 45 to 46 when uh, NACA acquired the aircraft for testing. And so we've actually got a picture, it's inside the aircraft right now, but it shows this exact airframe with this exact markings on it. And uh, they conducted tests with it, um, from what I understand, uh, stuff like aileron flutter, compressibility, um, other things like that. They had various probes on the aircraft. Uh, they had removed the guns and uh, kind of uh, set it up for their testing purposes. Um, it's, a, it's a great airplane. It's a unique aircraft. Uh, I heard Joe speak about earlier about the shakes on the panel. Uh, it's that drivetrain, something else. You, you crank it up and it uh, doesn't sound real happy at first. It kind of shakes, rattles, and rolls. And uh, so it gets your attention. You think you broke it at first. Well, uh, <laughs> Mark, uh, Rich is uh, up on the uh, Jumbotron here in a second. I think you'll, we'll be able to see the, uh, the there's, there's no engine up front. So what's the deal with that? Well, that's, that's part of the uniqueness of it. The engine's uh, a mid-engine. It's behind the cockpit. Um, actually just inches behind the, the pilot's seat and uh, you've got a drive shaft that runs right under your seat between your feet up to the uh, gearbox it's up here in the nose case here and it ties in ties in about right here the nose box is here and then you've got a 37 millimeter cannon that goes right through the top of it through the prop shaft and uh, you can see the 
barrel if you kind of look inside there. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a unique design. It's very unconventional even by today's standards, but especially back then. And uh, what type of engine is sitting behind you there? It's an Allison uh, V1710. Uh, basically the same horsepower as a Mustang? Just a about. Bit? This one's yep. rated at 1,500 horsepower, so very comparable okay. horsepower, um, comparable engine, uh, probably a little bit more reliable, but uh, it's, a <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good engine and a strong one at that. Okay. Super. Well, thank you, Mark. We put you on the spot there oh, a little bit, right. but I think that I know the people enjoyed that. Did we have a question? I saw somebody waving their hand back here. All right. Uh, Kyle, need your microphone back, Mike. Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Hey, Mark. Uh, this is for General Angle. I thought he's asking yeah, about the ahead. flying characteristics of the airplane. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, here. Uh, General Lingo, you mentioned about the uh, mishap with Scott Crossfield in the X-15 when it exploded. Uh, years ago, I remember seeing a video of that, and they mentioned something about high Gs and, and the record that was set. Do you remember what Scott Crossfield felt when when uh, that thing exploded, I think they had it recorded as a G, a G load record. I think you're right. And, and I think in honesty, uh, because of the, the way the explosion expanded, the G loads at, on that ground test were not really big. It would have been eyeballs in because he would have gotten shoved forward. So it would have been the right direction anyway. But I'll be honest with you, I don't remember what G's it was. I just remember getting the impression either from Scott or or from reading about it, that the G's were not particularly high. Um, I, I remember Scott uh, answering a, a, a group of people one night when we were together on the fo podium that said, "Well, what did you what did you feel uh, when that explosion happened on the pad?" And, and he very quietly, in a deep test pilot voice, said, "Well, I felt like I wanted to get the hell out of there as quick as I could." And, and uh, so I think, I think the forces weren't all that great. And I, I'll sure be corrected if someone's got any different data. Paul, oh, you got any different data on that? I'm sure in the archives. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> okay. We have another question. Oh, okay, sir. So for General Angle, could you uh, talk about how the technology of flight simulation changed from X-15 to Apollo and then to shuttle since you experienced all of that era? It, it improved by leaps and bounds. And, and I think that was a time frame where, techno where, where when we switched from analog to digital uh, and, and computers began to, began to become more of our lives, more commonplace in our lives, simulation capabilities and fidelity increased dramatically. And simulation became more and more of a factor in preparing an airplane and uh, and a pilot team uh, for flight. Uh, simulators were interesting, but not real helpful in a lot of cases. The X-15 started out with what we, we, we called the, the Iron Bird simulator, which was good to see how the control surfaces were going to react to pilot inputs, because it had the same length of hydraulic tubes and the, the same geometry and same dimensions at all. But it was limited by by software. So if I could just say something on that note. Um, simulation actually took another big technological leap in the 1950s in large part because of aircraft like these. So uh, this aircraft never actually flew in combat. It entered service. About 3,000 were produced. 2,400 went to Russia, primarily for the, rest, the, the Western Front. Some went to France, a few remained in the Air Force, six of them went to the NACA in the 45-46 period. At Langley what they did was um, put swept wings on it, one of the first tests of swept wings in flight was that. When it came to Ames, um, it was used to test for flutter, which became very important as bombers got bigger in the, in the 50s and then as we were building rockets in the 1960s. But uh, pretty much every aircraft that was built in the post-war period came to the NACA. It was expected that those pilots would fly every aircraft that was made in part to better understand handling qualities. 
So one of the pilots that flew this particular aircraft was George Cooper. Some of you may be familiar with the Cooper Harper rating scale. This was basically his experience in flying all these different aircraft and trying to understand the differences in handling and expressing those to engineers in quantitative terms that they would understand. So this aircraft was part of that uh, work that test pilots like George Cooper used to better describe the parameters so that they could be uh, pushed forward. And that was done very iteratively between the simulators. There were analog computers back at that time and maybe three or four um, axes of motion. Um, they certainly got a lot better in the 60s and 70s. But it was really in the 50s that I think test pilots start to be able to use simulators um, to make aircraft better. OK, we have another question here. Uh, yes, uh, General, uh, aside from the X-15 and the space shuttle, did you ever have the opportunity to fly any other of the, uh, the other X-planes? Uh, no, none, none of the other X-planes. I just got to fly the X-15. And if I were to, you know, if you ask the question now, which one would you rather fly, it would be the X-15. That was my favorite airplane. Even better than the shuttle? Even better than the shuttle. Because it, and that's, that's a great question, Connie, because the reason is that the X-15 did not have, a, it was not computer controlled at all. Uh, there were no computers in the X-15. It was a, uh, uh, from, your, from your pilot's control, there were cables and bell cranks and pulleys that went down and back to hydraulic actuators that you, that actually moved the surfaces. So you were really talking with you. You really were communicating with the airplane. And, and the best way I can, can uh, explain it, and it's not clear I know, but uh, when you communicate with an airplane like the space shuttle, boy, you can't imagine the amount of effort that's gone into to make the airplane pilot friendly and to make it responsive, to make the control forces harmonious of so pitch and roll go in harmony. and and the stick force gradient be the right feel and all. All that's done electronically now. And, but you don't feel that because what you're doing, you'll make a deflection with a stick, you're sending a signal to the computer, an electronic signal to the computer saying he wants two and a half degrees of pitch rate. And then it goes and looks at the gyros, look, looks at the gyros and says, I'm not doing two and a half degrees. I got. We need two and a half degrees. So it goes to the hydraulics, and the hydraulics move the surface until you get two and a half degrees. And and there's a in, there's a very small but still a noticeable delay in in that communication within the computer itself. And that sort of makes it obvious to the pilot that you're you're really t you can be communicating with the airplane, but you're communicating through an interpreter, and that's that's the computer. Is that fair? Oh yeah, I think I think uh, most pilots would say the X-15 uh, is that way. It's it's one of those. So NECA test flying changed dramatically. Uh, it, prior to the war, um, most test flights were done on standard aircraft where there was one or two parts modified to collect data. The X series, of course, was the start of NASA doing technology demonstrator sort of aircraft. But almost all of those, and even the technology demonstrator aircraft that you'll see NASA working on today with blended wing bodies and electric aircraft are pretty much single focus. But with the X-15, I got the sense that NASA thought that was their one chance to figure out as much as they possibly can about hypersonic flight. And they sort of threw this aircraft up there and they relied on pilots to be able to figure out what was going on with a lot of it. So a lot of it was unscripted with the X-15 in the way that was not true with the other X Very much series. so. And in all fairness, it, it also was an envelope, envelope expansion program. We had the luxury of expanding incrementally. Out. And one point I wanted to make out, Connie, I think, you, maybe it was Dave that stated, what did you learn, you know, big things you learned. And I, just, I homed in on speed heating, speed flight and heating and shock waves and temperature, and you helped tremendously on answering that. We also learned a lot in, on the altitude flights. Where and how do you transition from aerodynamic surfaces to reaction controls? And I, I do remember listening in, and I think I heard correctly, was that we would be told that basically you're going to be flying the airplane with, with the aerodynamic controls, with your right hand stick that goes to the surfaces up to about 240,000, maybe 250,000 feet. And above that, the, your surfaces won't be effective anymore. So you'll go to reaction control handle and, and control the attitude of the airplane with reaction controls as you arc over the top. Then as you come back in during re-entry, 
you're going to have to be flying with reaction controls until you get to about 250,000 or so, and, and then your surfaces will become first trim effective and then control effective, and so you can start flying with the, with the uh, rotational hand controller. And so that number, there was a magic number, was, was one of the things I figured, well, I guess that's what we're supposed to kind of figure out, is where that altitude is. Turns out it isn't, it isn't any one altitude. It's such a gradual blend from, from as you go up in, in altitude, you know, the density gets less and less, but it doesn't change with just step inputs. It very gradually changes. And so it, it's a slow, gradual transition, which led to and resulted to the adaptive flight control and the variable flight control system developed by Minneapolis Honeywell. And Okay, I, I was so enthralled with uh, your story, I lost Kyle, but we do, <laughs> we do have another question here. She's uh, right there. Uh, General Engel, I'm wondering about the, uh, when you flew that shuttle re-entry, after you do the deceleration burn, what kind of guidance are you using uh, to set up for the re-entry into, uh, into the atmosphere? We, we, we did have very good, guidance, uh, very good guidance systems that would um, indicate to you with an error needle whether you needed to roll right or left, or, uh, well, to roll right or left, really, because you controlled both ground track and your lift vector by bank angle. We, we flew a constant 40 degree bank angle all the way to, through the entry. This was to optimize the heating across on the, on the belly of the airplane. The, the flatter surface you can present to, to the atmosphere, to the free airstream while you're entering, the more you can spread out and the more you can stand off the shock wave where the, the high heat, high temperatures are, you can stand that shock wave far farther. If you pitch over, that, that shock wave tends to come in and wrap around your leading edges of your wing and, and tail and sharp, the relatively round or small diameter leading edge surfaces. So the, the re-entry is a trade-off between how much heat you can, can, can accept and how much performance you need. If you really need a lot of cross range, you need to back to bank over to the direction you need to go, and you actually need to drop the angle of attack to get to a better lift to drag ratio so that you get more performance and get more cross range. So, um, uh, so, so that, you, you know, there's the manually flying it was a matter of following what the, what the computer said Here's basically what I need, where we need to go, and you making the airplane go there. Cool. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I, we have one right over here. Here, here, here. The uh, application was torn up. How long did it take you to get back into the astronaut program? You said you applied to your officer in charge. How long did it take I, to get? She said your application was torn up, then how oh. long did it get, take you to get back in the astronaut program? I think it was either two or three years later that NASA had, a, had their next uh, selection. It must have been about three years later, cause, because I, I got about three really absolutely wonderful years flying the X-15. And then the next time around, I figured, well, I'm going to get reassigned anyway, so I might as well go to the moon if I can. So if we have another choice, we'll just go to the moon, right? The rest, <laughs> the rest of us would do that too, wouldn't we? Yeah. Okay, uh, Kyle, there's uh, one more right there, and this will be our last question uh, to the, I think we've kept all of you, but it's, uh, it's been really terrific. General, what was it like flying the F-104? The F-104 was a fun airplane to fly. Uh, every airplane has areas that you really are, feel comfortable in, and enjoy flying with it. It would go like a bat out of hell. It was really a good high performance airplane, straight and level. Uh, it was not a good turning or dog fighting airplane. And one of the reasons was the T-tail. That helped give it performance, but it, when you were in a dog fight and you were pulling G's, those little short stubby wings giving you primary lift, the, the wingtip vortices, the vortices would come off the wingtip and swirl around and, and they'd be swirling down, pushing down on the T-tail. So you'd be pulling in on somebody and all of a sudden the airplane would, would pitch up on you and go out of control. And it was very difficult to break from a spin. So it was a great go, to, go like a bat airplane and we used it for training for the X-15 and for the space shuttle. It made a good trainer for practicing the approach and landing 
uh, because we can match the performance of the space shuttle with both the T-38 and the uh, uh, and uh, and the F-104. It also uh, and and but it it was just a fun airplane to fly. Again, it was a very comfortable airplane, a cockpit to go crawl in and sit in, and felt well designed. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Engel, we thank and you very much. Connie, Glenn, thank you. Glenn, thank you for being here. My the aircraft Glenn, owners, thanks. NASA, thanks. I enjoyed all that. the people yeah, that made you. this happen. Uh, I, to the veterans, step over to uh, the building there and uh, be sure to pick up your veterans' hats. We have the programs here. And my thank you to all of you for being here and making 2017 a tremendous success. Been a great, great program. And uh, thanks again to the Sleeping Dog Productions crew for uh, streaming us to 105 countries. Are there really 105 countries? You know, but anyway, we've been uh, streaming worldwide, so thank you all.